recent trend seems to have arisen in the world of media discourse, that the quality of a film can be in part or wholly quantified by how successful it is either at the box office or in numbers of viewers. This has inspired me to look at films that were flops on initial release and TV shows that struggled in their first season, but that have gone on to be part of the pop culture zeitgeist of famous flops. The first film I'll be reviewing has perhaps made the most indelible mark on 20th and 21st century culture. It's referenced in hundreds of other films and TV shows, has spawned thousands of pieces of spin-off merchandise, and is likely the most watched film in history but was something of a flop on initial release, and took ten years to become profitable. It now regularly features in lists of the greatest films of all time, and is one of a handful of films to feature on UNESCO's Memory of the World Register. That film is, of course, The Wizard of Oz. Based on L. Frank Baum's 1900 novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which had already been adapted on film making this a remake as well as a flop. After the success of Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, rival film studios saw there was money in adapting classic children's stories. So, a year later, in 1938, MGM acquired the rights to The Wizard of Oz. Confusingly, from Samuel Goldwyn, who had previously sold his previous firm, Goldwing Pictures, to Marcus Lowe to create the studio MGM. The script then went through the kind of tumult that so many movie scripts seem to go through in this era. With producer Mervyn Leroy's assistant, William H. Cannon, submitting a four-page outline that toned down most of the magical elements before Leroy hired Hollywood legend and Citizen Kane scribe Herman J. Mankiewicz to submit a draft, then Noel Langley and poet Ogden Nash. Langley submitted four different scripts. Also working on the script were Florence Ryerson, Edgar Allan Wolfe, Victor Fleming and John Lee Mahin, but it was Langley, Ryerson and Wolfe who would be ultimately credited with this Frankenstein script, although there were apparently contributions from at least ten other writers, including the two songwriters, Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg. In the original books, Oz is a real place that Dorothy visits, but as the producers didn't think audiences would buy into this premise, they made the Oz portion of the film a dream sequence, which I guess disproves the old writing adage that you never end a story with it was a dream all along. Edits to the script continue to be made up to and during production, with a singing contest between a Princess of Oz and Dorothy, where Dorothy's modern swing style wins out against the princess's snobbish operetta, and a romantic subplot between Dorothy and Hunk, the real-world version of the Scarecrow, thankfully being dropped before filming, and a song called The Jitterbug filmed but cut out from the final movie. The casting of the film was equally as complicated as the writing. While Shirley Temple and Deanna Durbin were apparently considered for the role of Dorothy, Judy Garland was already under contract with MGM, and so the relatively simple decision was made. However, Ray Bolger was originally cast as the Tin Man, but longed to play the Scarecrow, and so agreed with producer Leroy and Buddy Ebsen who had been cast as the Scarecrow, to swap roles. However, Ebsen suffered from a toxic reaction to the aluminium powder used in his makeup and was hospitalised as a result. He was replaced by Jack Haley, as was the toxic aluminium powder for a slightly less toxic paste. Gail Sandergaard was cast as the Wicked Witch, but quit after the role was changed from being sly and glamorous to ugly and crone-like, at which point contract player Margaret Hamilton was cast with just three days to spare before filming began. 
She also suffered for the movie, receiving third-degree burns from a special effect which left her hospitalised for three months. W.C. Fields was cast as the wizard after Ed Wynn had turned down the part but spent too long negotiating his fee, so MGM again went with contract player Frank Morgan. Part of Morgan's costume as the wizard was a scruffy coat from a second-hand shop that, while filming, Morgan apparently discovered had belonged to L. Frank Baum. But this is likely to be a rumour that Margaret Hamilton believed came from the studio. The roles of the Munchkins also presented a unique problem, finding over a hundred little people for these roles. Talent scouts were sent out across the US to look for people of the correct stature. Or, I should say, white people of the correct stature, as the studio didn't want any people of colour in the roles. For many of these actors, or at the time non-actors, this was the first time they would meet other little people, and as a result, many Munchkin actors had a deeply emotional reaction many meeting their spouses at the time. But for one group of already established performers, the Leo Singer Midgets, it meant their salvation, as MGM paid for their escape from Nazi Germany just months before World War II broke out. At this point, I'm sure it won't surprise you to learn that finding a director for this film was also no picnic. Richard Thorpe replaced Norman Turog before himself being briefly replaced by George Cukor. This was early in production and Cukor got rid of the blonde wig and heavy makeup Judy Garland initially had to wear as well as bringing in Jack Haley as the Tin Man. He didn't end up shooting any footage as he was already working on Gone with the Wind, but when Victor Fleming, the credited director, was brought on, he kept Cukor's creative changes and basically started filming from square one again. He filmed the majority of the movie but then replaced George Cukor on Gone with the Wind, so King Vidor was brought in to finish the production, including filming the iconic Over the Rainbow sequence. As well as the production issues I've mentioned, there was also, quite frankly, abusive treatment of Garland, who had her chest bound and was prescribed Benzedrine to control her appearance, as well as being fed uppers to keep her awake and downers to allow her to sleep. Oh, and they also used asbestos flakes as fake snow, which was not uncommon at the time, but obviously not great. While the use of Technicolor in film was not unheard of at this time, it was still fairly rare, and black and white films would still be standard for the next two decades. But its use in this film is exceptionally well done, and an ingenious way to demonstrate Dorothy's emotional state as she transitions from her drab and dissatisfied life to the bright hope of Oz a transition that was done by the use of simple but clever in-camera trickery. When Dorothy steps out of her sepia-toned house, it's actually Garland's double wearing a completely brown and white version of the costume, in a sepia-painted set, looking out at a Technicolor Oz. Only for Garland, in the now-coloured costume, to step out... In a move only a studio could consider making, MGM nearly cut over the rainbow, as they were worried it took too long to get to Oz, a move that would have changed the course of film history and Garland's career in unimaginable ways, as this would become her signature song. As I said at the start, the film premiered in 1939, but too little success. It was reasonably popular, but well below expectations and box office receipts, and didn't finally turn a profit until 1949. In 1956, the film had its television premiere and dominated in the ratings, getting even more viewers 
when it was shown three years later. It subsequently became a staple of American television and quickly entered the popular culture lexicon. This continued with subsequent home movie releases on video, laserdisc, DVD, Blu-ray and, more recently, 4K Ultra Blu-ray in a wide variety of different special editions, ultimate editions or collector's editions. It is now beloved with devoted fans all over the world, including my partner, which makes buying Christmas presents for her pretty easy because there's just so much Oz merchandise to choose from. The big question, though, is is it any good? And the answer is yes, it's a masterpiece. The effects still hold up pretty well, as does the character makeup. The plot, while seemingly fairly standard, delves into self-discovery as Dorothy, tired of her rural existence and being terrorised by her wicked neighbour, is transported to a magical land where she makes new friends and has the chance of a better life before eventually realising that there's no place like home. But it also does a lot more. By presenting Dorothy's home life as not just difficult, but harrowing, as Almira Gulch genuinely plans to kill her dog. While I would have been curious to see Dorothy go all John Wick on Gulch, it gives her a genuine reason to want to stay in Oz with her new friends, having defeated evil and gained agency, only returning home because she misses her aunt and uncle. This gives the audience a dilemma. Would you choose to return to the ever-present threat of dog murder in order to be with your aunt and uncle again, or would you stay in Oz, maybe even becoming the king or queen? Sure, I could have stayed in the past. Could have even been king. The use of dual casting for the Kansas and Oz characters of the witch, the wizard and the scarecrow, tin man and lion, but not Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, is also very clever, as it makes Dorothy's decision all the more difficult, giving her almost everything the real world does apart from her aunt and uncle. The performances also help as they are all excellent, with Garland's earnest portrayal of Dorothy the highlight, with able support from Margaret Hamilton's terrifying villain, who scared countless generations of children. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog too. (laughs) And Ray Bulger's Scarecrow, a touching and subtle emotional performance, coexisting with an over-the-top physical performance, aided by Jack Haley and Bert Lahr as the Tin Man and Cowardly Lion. I were the king of the forest. The musical numbers are catchy and never outstay their welcome, and the film moves at a healthy pace, managing to cram a lot into its under two hour runtime. It's not perfect by any means, due to the uneven production process and certain cuts made after filming, there are a few lines of dialogue that no longer make sense in the greater scheme of the film, and some continuity issues caused by this, but nothing that really has a huge impact on the overall enjoyment of the story. Over the years, many apocryphal tales have sprung up surrounding the film, such as the coat story I mentioned, but also stories of munchkins staging drunken orgies, a suicide being caught in the background of the finished film, and Pink Floyd making Dark Side of the Moon to sync perfectly with the film. None of these are true. The munchkins, with only one or two exceptions, were extremely well behaved, It's actually an escaped bird that we see in the background of a shot from a sequence that was cut from a film, and it's coincidence that Dark Side of the Moon appears to almost just about sync up with the film. What is true is that this film has a legacy far beyond any other of that of any era, and remains a beloved favourite, despite being famously a flop 
on initial release. Thank you. Goodbye. Fly, my pretties. Fly!